Welcome to the time that everybody looks forward to the most each month. The June. Speak for yourself. <laughs> well, welcome to the select board meeting. Let's jump right into the agenda. We'll ask, does anybody have any changes recommended to the agenda today? I do not. No? No. no. Neither do I, so no changes to the agenda. <clears throat> we'll look at the minutes from last time. They are lengthy, but I've read them. I think they're pretty factual as to what happened. Okay. And I would move that we approve. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Minutes have been approved from the last select board meeting. Moving on to the treasurer's report. Uh, for May, total revenue is $254,007.52. $250,000 of that is a part of the loan for FEMA. Uh, the expenditures was $98,481.68, and the balance as of 531.24 is $295,448.65. Delinquent taxes owed Reporting to the- Reporting in progress. What was that? We have to repeat everything that was said before this to make sure we have it recorded. I'm just kidding. Really? Just kidding. No. <laughs> All right, can I start with delinquent taxes now, Mr. Yes. Chairman? <laughs> yes, Mr. Allen, please. Uh, Owed to the town delinquent taxes $51,482.64. That is the treasurer's report. Once you approve that, I got a couple of other items. Okay. Any comments, issues? No. Okay. Move that it be accepted as written. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. I do have an update on the tax sale. Good. People yes. asked last month about the tax sale. Uh, they were held April 10th, 2024. There are two properties that were scheduled. Kenneth Sturm, this property had no bidders and therefore did not sell. At this time, the property is on the market for sale and Reading will recover all funds when sold. That is the property on the end of North Bucker Brush, just before it intersects with uh, Town Hill on the left, if you're going over from here. Matthew Stevens' property. This property was bought by Charlie Johnson. After the sale, it was discovered that the property could not go to tax sale as the owner is deceased and there is no ex executor or administrator. Callista spoke with John Springer about this and he confirmed it could not be sold. The funds were returned to Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson's attorney called Callista and said there was no reason to believe this could not be sold. Callista contacted John Springer and he wrote a letter to Mr. Johnson's attorney explaining why the town was not selling the property. So nothing, basically nothing happened. Nothing <laughs> happened, okay. No bids on the first property and we no. can't sell the second property. Okay. Where's Good. the Stevens property? That is at the intersection of Center Road and Matthews Drive. It's that trailer right on the corner. Lisa. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Anything else from the treasurer's side? Uh, not that won't come up later in the agenda. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, that's it for the treasurer's report then. Moving on to the action items. Do we have our friends from Mark here with us today? Excellent. Yes. So the first item on the agenda that we had was, um, I believe you all wanted to do a review of the town plan in conjunction with the select board and the planning committee commission. Yeah, it's a little broader than that. Um, you know, really, so we're, I'm Jason Rasmussen from Mark, now the regional commission. Jason, can I, can I just ask, I, I should have mentioned at the beginning, one of the things that we've been, been hearing, for, at least from the folks that are on Zoom, is that the acoustics in the room are terrible and it's hard to hear people, so I'm going to ask that we be a little more vigilant about trying to use the microphone if you're speaking from the audience, okay? And I'll talk a little more about that at the end, too. 
Thanks, Jason. Go ahead. Sure. Thanks. Um, so the Regional Planning Commission uh, under state law is supposed to come to the, our, you know, each town every couple of years and just say, what's going on? How can we help? Um, as part of that, there's this town plan review. More importantly to me is what's going on and how can we help you? Um, so it, just as a form of background, um, I think Bob and some of you are very familiar with this, but just to get a sense of what we do, um, really briefly, you know, we're a, a subdivision of state law, and we're, we really exist to, we have a, we serve a 10 town area in Southern Windsor County, and we exist to basically do technical assistance for our towns. And so we work in town plans and zoning and training and that kind of thing. Um, we have a big water quality program. We have grants that we give out to towns right now. We're, we're administering a grant program for the state. We do emergency management. Um, you know, when the flood happens, we have a role to play there. We do mapping, we do grant writing. More and more that we're, we're getting um, asked to do like some level of help for town staffing. So we've, we've been doing interim zoning administration work in some towns. There's a lot more talk about multi-town staffing, whether that's through us or otherwise. So you know, we're just, we're basically a resource to you and we wanna be as helpful as we can, whether it's capital planning, like the wastewater study or any other thing. Um, so again, we really want to get a sense of what's going on here in Reading and how can we help. But we, we should talk a little bit about your town plan and kind of fill you in on that. And so Martha's done a, a review and she's going to hit some of the highlights uh, on that. So I'm Martha Harrison, I'm also from the Madison Regional Commission. Um, and just we have to go through periodically this whole exercise on uh, how well your plan, whether it includes the required elements for a town plan, whether it meets the statewide planning goals. So I looked at all that um, with the goal of coming up with some recommendations for next time when you update your plan. Um, one thing I would suggest, your land use chapter says that uh, you'd like to have an agricultural overlay district in your zoning regulations. And if that's something that you're still interested in when you redo your plan, it would be helpful to include a map on your future land use map, just laying out what that might look like. Uh, that same chapter land use talks about considering village center designation for Hammondsville and South Reading. So again, to- Martha, can, can I just, can I just ask, are we gonna get this in writing so I just- I, Yeah, I can, I can send it to you. Okay, yeah. great, thanks. I don't have extra copies now, but I'll send it to you. Okay. Um, yep, so for village center designation, if that's something that you're still gonna wanna pursue, consider whether, um, well, how that would meet the town's goals, whether it's consistent with the uh, regional plan, especially with regard to Hammondsville, because there's a little bit of a conflict in the designation for that area. Um, and then in your transportation chapter, it does say this in your local hazard mitigation plan that you, you know, you should keep up with your culvert inventory, update it every three years. <coughs> That's what keeps you eligible for highway grants. Um, doesn't explicitly say it in your town plan, so it would probably be a good idea to include that. Also, um, you're not due to update your plan until 2030 and the municipal road general permit deadline is December 31st, 2036. So since that will be in the time period that your next plan is gonna cover, it would be good to have more detail in the plan about what's required, um, progress you've made, what you still need to accomplish for that. But it um, sounds like you're saying that the plenty of time if we're not updating until 2030, that's not due until 2036, is that what you just said? That the municipal road general permit, towns have to be in compliance with that. They have to have completed all their road upgrades by 2036. I mean, that uh, 2030 is when your town current town plan would expire. Yep. You don't, I mean, you can 
updated earlier if you decide that you want to. Uh, so your plan has lots of information about natural resources, but not quite as much on infrastructure and human resources. So an, another thing I would suggest is going into some more detail about your existing facilities and their capacity to meet future needs. And so as an example, the town garage, the plan basically says we have a town garage. <laughs> um, so it would be good to know when was it built, what condition is it in, is it big enough to house all your equipment, or do you need some, uh, you know, maybe an, uh, an additional, some additional space there or something. Um, same with services, it's just very brief and it'd be good to know, you know, how many firefighters and EMTs you have, how many calls they go on, do they, what else do they need to continue providing the services they provide to the community. Um, this section of the plan also talks about your town hall and fire station being emergency shelters. Um, well, the local hazard mitigation plan, I'm sorry, uh, says that those two buildings are your emergency shelters. And it would be helpful, I think, to have that in the town plan along with some additional detail about the capacity of those buildings to serve that purpose. You know, do they have enough space? Do they have backup power? Do they have restroom facilities? Can, is there heating and cooling capacity, kitchen facilities, and so on and so forth for those? Um, you're currently undergoing a water and wastewater feasibility study, which is great, and that'll provide a lot of information that you can use to inform your next town plan update. Um, there's a little bit of a mismatch in, so Renny, you guys uh, adopted your plan in February of 2022, and then the most recent regional plan was not adopted till October of 2022, so the information you were using from the regional plan to update your plan was from 2018, so it's a little bit out of date. Um, one example that I thought was interesting from 2010 to 2020, Reading had the largest decrease in 18 to 64 year olds, which is the workforce age group. So it might be interesting to think about what implications there are to that change. Um, with the energy plan, um, first of all, you guys have a great <laughs> energy board, uh, um, so yay. <laughs> um, the energy chapter, it has some of the information is out of date, it gets dated quickly, which in, in some ways is good because it indicates that you're making progress on fuel switching for vehicles and homes and things like that. So, but that's one thing to do is to update your data. And then the state has also come out with new guidance for enhanced energy planning and new LEAP data. I forget what LEAP stands for, but- Let's just call it energy data. Energy <laughs> data. <laughs> um, and there's also a new climate action plan, a new comprehensive energy plan. Um, and. I know some of the towns in our area have a solar resources and wind resources map and Reading doesn't have one at the, at the moment, so it'd be good to include that with your next update. I think we do. Okay, I didn't, it's, I didn't see it. Yeah. Um, there's new requirements for including greenhouse gas emissions uh, targets in your energy chapter. So that's something you'll have to include. That's something everyone's gonna have to include in their next updates. Um, and by the time you get to that update, you'll probably know a lot about your new solar array and hopefully you'll have some municipal energy resilience projects completed on some of the buildings. and. So mentioning that and maybe looking at the impact that those projects have had would be interesting. Um, the HOME Act, which passed last year and had a lot of 
implications for zoning, also had implications for town plans. So towns are gonna to need to be more detailed about analyzing their existing housing stock, like specifically how many of this type of house do we have and how many of this type of house do we have and what do we need and what's the gap there and specific actions that can be taken to address that deficit between what you have and what you need. Um, and then flood resilience, I mean, Flood and erosion hazard areas are on your water resources map, and there's a brief section under natural resources about flood resilience. But given the impact that floods have had in Reading, I, I thought it would make sense to maybe go into a little more depth on flood resilience next time you do an update. Um, you, you did recently update your local hazard mitigation plan and that certainly addresses floods and you know one way you can go into more depth is to reference you know incorporate the LHMP into your town plan by reference and then include some of the information from that key points in your town plan and um, one of the recommendations is to uh, look at it every year look at what the recommendations are and see how, you know, what progress you're making on that. On the um, hazard mitigation plan. Right. Yes, okay. Right. Well, both ideally, but <laughs> yes. And um, you may also want to consider updating your flood hazard regulations at some point. I was going to say river corridor, but the there's a new state law that just became law without the governor's signature that looks like it's going to be, the, like the state is going to be taking jurisdiction over um, river corridors, so. Yeah, for, <clears throat> for if you want the details, it's Senate Bill 213. And so that passed, again, without the governor's signature. That'll be a state river corridor permitting process, but that won't really kick in for I think it's 2028, so we have some time before we get to that point. That's it. That's so are there any questions on those details from Martha? Again, you know, we can follow up and give you the written summary of that stuff, but I think your plan's very recent, still relatively, you know, quite good. Um, so these are just suggestions for the next time. Are there any questions? No, oh. uh, excuse me. No, please go ahead. I don't have a question. Uh, Jason, but I do want to say that the MARC, the Mount Escutney Regional Commission, and the Southern Windsor County Regional Planning Commission prior to that, both Cindy Ingersoll and Chris Yurick have been very helpful to the town in obtaining the grants and aid uh, money and also helping us with selecting sites and things like that. And I can't tell you how many thousands of dollars we've received through that program since it came in in 2016 or 17, I'm not sure when it was. Uh, but they have been deeply involved in that and it's been a great help to the select board and the highway crew. Taking that a little bit further, you talked about the culvert inventory and being sure that's up to date every three years. Uh, Glenn has an online program that is connected with the state and it is updated, I could say daily, but is updated anytime we make a change or find something to a culvert. So it is up to date Good. as of June 10th, as much as it possibly can be uh, with everything that's changed with the flood and things like that. That's great. One last thing on the uh, uh, municipal uh, <clears throat> permit, we have probably about 20 to 25 sections that will be upgraded this summer and fall, I believe, uh, through the grants and aid. Now, some of them are not in red, and for those of you that don't know what I'm saying there, if it is in red, it is high priority. Some are very high priority as far as water quality goes. Not all of them are in red, but a lot of them are uh, uh, signified as a 
high priority project and we're working on those as fast as we can. And I think that there will be at least 20 more done uh, before the end of the year. Great. Which will move us along and get us back into compliance with the benchmarks that they've set for December 30th of every year. We were three down last December, uh, three short of what the benchmark was, and I think we'll be well over the benchmark by December of this year. Which, which plan is this, Bob, that we're talking about? This is the uh, MRGP. It's a municipal road general permit. Okay. Uh, uh, it's basically a state stormwater permit, and each town has to do all this stuff. So you need, the town a number of years ago did an inventory of these, um, what they call hydrologically connected segments. So the road segments that are close to water. Mm -hmm. You have to do certain treatments to improve water quality. And um, there's certain benchmarks, like Bob's saying, that the town needs to meet. And um, so we're, we really try to connect you with the grants. So there's grants and aid, there's better roads, there's some of these other programs that we, we've been trying to help you out with as much as we can. And there will be, in the next couple of years, probably a, you'll need to update your MRGP inventory. And again, we're, we're always happy to help with that stuff. Great. Great question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> Kevin Kaya, on the uh, culvert inventories, does that mean that every culvert is mapped? Yes. Does it mean that um, they are assessed whether they're working or not? They, they were what? all assessed uh, how long ago? Jason, a few years ago. I don't remember, to be totally honest, probably, we probably did it originally like maybe 10 or something years ago, but it's been updated periodically. Right. So it, they were all assessed at that point in time, Kevin, and uh, uh, the ones that were at that time deemed uh, totally deficient, most of those have either been cleaned, changed, or upgraded, and obviously, with the floods and things like that, we're not keeping up with changing all of them that we need to change, and we're finding more as we go along, but we're changing them whenever we can, or cleaning them, or doing whatever needs to be done. So when there's an assessment, um, who assesses, and how are they designed? Are they set the properly? Are they uh, sized properly for the watersheds, or the small? Uh, road runoff areas, the, are they sized? The assessment originally was done by a gentleman that was working through, yeah, at that time, Southern Windsor County. And his assessment was uh, used to make some upgrades. Currently, uh, we can ask for help, but most of the assessment's being done by the road crew. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> And for what it's worth, the inventory is on a thing called vtculverts.gov or .org maybe? Dot, .org, I think. Uh, vtculverts.org, I believe uh, is what it is. I forgot to bring my phone or I can tell so you, you what it you is. You could look it up if you wanted to. Hmm. So again, you know, I think, you know, from my point of view, I really want to know what, what can we help you out with that we're not already helping you out with. Well, let me just ask <clears throat> before we open it up. So our plan was just updated, as you said, in 2022, yep. right? Next one is due 2030, so it's yep. an every eight year thing. That's right. The review that you just did, is this an annual thing or what is, um, what prompted this review from you today? It's been a while, to be honest, uh, that, that we've done it here in Reading. Um, there's a lot of new board members, so we thought it made some sense to, to do this this year. Um, we're supposed to do it, I think it's twice every eight years or okay. more frequently. So, okay. you know, in another four years or something, we'll come back, but, yeah. um, or something like that. But that's, that's the idea, just to come back periodically to, to understand what's going on. Yeah, obviously it's a, a number of the things that we talked about are fluid and putting them in a plan, as soon as you publish the plan, they're outdated. <laughs> so we struggle with that. It's obviously a major update. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm looking for recommendations. Are there ways that we can structure the plan so that maybe there's less information in the basic plan and there are, I don't know, a, 
appendices or things like that that maybe can be updated and changed more current, more regularly, something along those lines. I don't know, but doing a, a full town plan update, obviously for, especially for some of the things that change when you talk about emergency services, how many firefighters do we have, how many EMTs, things like that, how many culverts do we have. It, this, the information doesn't seem like it's all that relevant to the plan. It seems like it should be more of a forward-thinking document about where is the town going in certain areas. Yeah, I certainly I hear that uh, definitely. And it, it takes a long time to update a whole plan. Yeah, you can. There's no reason you could not do a small amendment. Like if something's out of date, you really want to focus on the energy chapter, just do that one, um, or the housing chapter, or something like that. It really depends. And I think there's a lot of this stuff, the MRGP work can happen outside of the plan. I mean, it's sure. an annual budgeting process, maybe it's a five-year budgeting process, grant writing, project management, those sorts of things. So it, that may not necessarily have to be in the town plan. So again, it depends. Um, I think in the longer term, you could potentially reorganize the plan and maybe have one section that talks about key goals or action steps and then maybe that's where you do amendments and you don't worry yeah. about the text and, and the, that yeah. sort of thing. Um, so I think really did you just say, I mean, did you say it's possible to update a single chapter without changing the whole plan? It's possible, yeah. You can amend a plan, you can amend one goal. I mean, you know, hmm. whatever, okay. whatever really works because stuff changes in eight years. Uh, yep. Eight years is kind of a long time so you're, you can always update things. Yeah. It could be small or it could be more Yeah, and I'm, and I'm not saying that we want to do that. I'm not saying that to the PC or anything like that. I just want to know what what's the art of the possible and where, you know, where should we be looking right now? It, it used to be every five years. And then okay. a few years ago, they right. yep. made it longer. Okay. And just, you know, on the designation part of things, so right now, Felchville is a designated village center. If the Act 250 bill We'll know by Thursday whether the governor signs it or not. Um, if that becomes law, the regional plan um, is going to play a much bigger role in the designation program. So basically, our future land use map in the regional plan is going to basically determine what gets designated in the future. Um, so when that, if and when that comes to pass, we'll be back because we want to make sure we're working very closely with you on how we map mm -hmm. ready. Okay. Good. Somebody was had their hand up. Good. Bill, I think you were first. Okay. Good. Uh, so I understand that <clears throat> in the last week, uh, the state of Vermont passed a first in the nation law um, assessing uh, fossil fuel burners um, uh, for the, uh, the impact uh, that they've implied on their burning of fossil fuel. So my question is, will the data needed uh, from the state to make the assessment against the Chevron and the Exxon and uh, any other large burners of fossil fuel uh, be come from uh, the region, from the town, or are we gonna, it, will the town be um, asked uh, to uh, for the data for the uh, input. I don't know. <laughs> I wish I knew. I wish I knew the answer. Uh, to that. I don't know. All right. So uh, yeah, my information is based on a newspaper article, uh, um, so I don't know. I, I'm it not sounds sure. like that's going to happen. Yeah, I'm not that up on that bill, and I'm not really sure where the data is coming from off the top of my head. I'm sure there will be a lot more information right. coming out if it has if it does and has become law as we go forward. It, it is law, but it's going to be challenged. It, oh yeah, no question. Yeah. 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 Yep. Bill. I just wanted to offer a couple of comments. One is a member of the Energy Committee, and one just as a Garden Variety resident. First of all, uh, Martha's been fantastically helpful to the committee. Um, and it's been critical because when I first, I'm sort of taking my energy committee hat off now, just reacting as a resident. When I first was asked by one of the previous members of the planning commission to look at the town plan, 
specifically the energy and the uh, housing sections, because I had some professional experience in those two arenas. It, it initially struck me as, well, this is nice. This is about 10 or 20 years worth of work in each of these arenas, and there's no sense of, of you know, in, in, in most business enterprises, whether it be for-profit or non-profit, I've worked in usually organizations develop a strategic plan that identifies priorities, resource allocations, costs, and timetables in, in the town plan, while a useful document doesn't really zero in on, you know, What's like, it, like if you asked previous or current select board, what's the top priority in the, just in the energy section, the housing section, I don't think anyone could answer that question. Which for a group of volunteers, we're trying to do our best with no sense of priority and no sense of resources. Um, we're trying to sort of figure out, well, what, what can we get done with what we have, which isn't much. We got four or five people who are putting in a ton of time. Um, and Martha's been trying to drum up some resources through the state, which has taken maybe longer than I'll live to see it, but it's, at least it's the ball's in motion. So what I'm saying is maybe the select board's role, so you have to redo the plan every year, would be to just to think about a sort of, a, sort of an add-on, more focused document, which would be more like a traditional strategic plan, would help any of the committees better understand what the select board wants to see, or your sense of what the priority should be, because we don't have the money or the time or the resources to do all that stuff. We just don't. If they have a decision before them on how to interpret the zoning um, regulations and state statutes and that sort of thing? Yeah, you know, we, we try to. Um, it really depends on the board asking for help. Um, yet, but yes, we can do some trainings and we can, on occasion, um, be there during the hearing and just help answer questions or, or be a resource. Any other comments? Okay, I think this. Uh, no, just uh, maybe quickly, Robert, uh, when you were listing the jobs that were on the um, MRGP, and you said some of them were red, that were critical, had to be prioritized, where is that list? Uh, basically, it's as Jason said, it's uh, the, the entire road network is divided up into 330 foot long segments. Mm -hmm. So where a segment is uh, directly dumping water into the brook, there are certain regulations that we have to go through to right. mitigate that as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Stone lining ditches so that you don't get a lot of silt and stuff coming down and through the culvert and into the brook. Uh, Headers on culverts, which will help with flood control as well as making sure the water gets through the culvert. Uh, uh, grading the roads so that the water sheets off rather than runs down ditches and things like that, Lisa. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, there's, there's quite a list of different uh, things that you can undertake to mitigate water going directly from the ditch to the brook with a whole bunch of sediment and rocks and sticks and whatever in mm -hmm. it. Uh, not every place can be taken care of and you can apply for an exemption. Uh, for instance, the Tyson Road from here to South Reading is, is almost all red, uh, but there's many places where that we could self-certify and say that is the best we can possibly do. And if anybody takes issue with that, they can come in and give us a suggestion. But we have not had anyone from the state, from the Better Roads Program or the Grants and Aid Program, which uh, Chris and, and Cindy are deeply involved, um, question what we did or did not do so far. Great. So I guess my question more specifically was, are there specifics, like where is the map that shows where these sites it's, are within It's an town? online map, uh, okay. Lisa. There is a live, well, there was a large one here somewhere, but it's outdated now. Mm -hmm. But it's online. I can get you okay. some information where you can go look. Great. Thank you. Yep. Anything else? <clears throat> Bob, get anything? Anything else? No. Oh. Okay. Jason, Martha, thank you very much. Appreciate it.
Thanks for having us. And again, if there's anything that ever comes up that you want our help with, feel free to. You know, I think you know how to get hold of us. We do. <laughs> <laughs> I got you on speed dial. Exactly. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right, moving down through the agenda. Uh, highways. Is Glenn on? I don't see him. Don't see him. I'm going to have to get after him. It's been him. several months now that. No, he was on last month. Was he? Yeah. Okay. I think he was. Uh, quickly, uh, on highways, we uh, are continuing to scrape. We're continuing to spread gravel when we can get it. The pit at Sosasimos is not crushing the top coat type of gravel that we really need to smooth out some of the flood work that we've done. Uh, Glenn and Mark spent most of last week cleaning the inlets and outlets of some of the ditches along Tyson Road and some of the other areas in anticipation of the heavy rain that was coming. We got about a half inch, three quarters of an inch, and it was not near as heavy as forecast, so no problems there. Um, I did not talk with Glenn today, so I can't tell you what the plan is to, uh, this week, but last week the plan was to start cleaning dishes. Okay. So. Okay. This one. FEMA? Sure. Uh, I got a little more information than I've had in the past. We're continuing to work with the FEMA representative on a weekly basis. Uh, we now have $864,808.41 in expenses uh, that have been submitted to FEMA. Now, two of those total about $750,000 by themselves, and that's the Grasshopper Culvert and the Archer Bridge. So it's not as big as you might think. We get by those two, the number will go down drastically. We did run into a few questions on the contracts that we used for the uh, culvert and the bridge. Uh, nothing negative, but just questions that we never answered when we were doing just highways, uh, uh, such as what a copy of the contract with the, with the contractor and how much material was used because it was basically a lump sum. $10,000 for two inch stone or whatever it was. Well, they wanted to know how many cubic yards of stone that represented. So we've got three or four questions like that pending on those two projects. We have $99,170.85 that's been obligated by FEMA. And that is Spear Cemetery, Caper Hill, Weld Cemetery, Tattle Street, South Bucker Brush, Brown Schoolhouse, and 20 Mile Stream. Those roads have all been obligated by FEMA uh, to be paid, and the total of that is $99,170. So we're, we're moving forward. Once we get these two big ones done and Tyson Road done, we'll be down to, I think, four, yeah, four projects to do. <clears throat> when you say it's obligated to be paid, you mean that they've agreed to pay, but they haven't paid yet? Uh, three of them have been paid, but it's only totaling about $29,000. Okay. Uh, the other three are obligated, which totals about $65,000. And uh, uh, once it goes into the obligated category, uh, it's just a matter of time. Okay. It's, they have, FEMA's happy, they've sent it to the state, and once FEMA's happy, the state sends us some money. Okay. But, when they get around to it, they send us some money. Right. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Uh, that's basically where we're at. Thank, Thank you. you. Any comments? No, no. Good. Uh, all right, next one is on the emergency watershed protection. Um, some of you may know that we met, or I should say last week, the program manager from the federal government requested a meeting with the State River Engineer, with the engineer that we have hired to do the design work on these several sites we have for the EWP program. And uh, so they met and discussed 
each site individually to make sure that the design engineer understands the requirements from both the federal government and the state government for how to design the fixes in these areas uh, to make sure that the project gets paid for by the federal government. So uh, things, are, things are progressing. Um, I think the, the rough timeline that we're talking about is probably to have work start on these areas in the September timeframe four sites along Millbrook uh, and have, again, everything completed by the, you know, before the snow flies by the end of this calendar year. And all still looks as if it's on track for those efforts. Okay. The people that are most closely involved that where they're gonna be working right in their backyard, uh, we're updating them regularly on what's happening uh, in their, you know, in their area, okay? Next item we had was uh, the Village Trust Initiative. Uh, Jack, did you have anything new or things uh, you wanted to? Uh, uh, so the only update we can uh, give you right now is that um, uh, since our last meeting, uh, we were interviewed um, as a group um, uh, to uh, for the village trust uh, uh, initiative people to get a sense of who we are, what's going on, um, uh, and I think we uh, presented ourselves well. Um, uh, there was uh, a, a lot of emphasis that we placed uh, on uh, community involvement and support of local government. Thank you again for that. Um, and, um, you know, I think uh, we showed ourselves off well. Uh, uh, we understand now from that interview that there were 80 intake forms uh, um, given to the Village Trust. Uh, they're gonna, hone that group, uh, number down to 20. Um, so uh, we're keeping our fingers crossed that uh, we're gonna fall into that first uh, group. And- uh, So the interview that you're talking about was done by the state? This is not like a, the, the local TV station or newspaper? No, it was, okay. <laughs> it was the Preservation Trust and the VCR, uh, VCRD, uh, who uh, they're the the two um, nonprofits that have uh, come together to to create uh, the new entity, the Village Trust Initiative, um, and um, we're meeting constantly, uh, and uh, we're always looking for input from the community. Uh, there, uh, there's nothing. Uh, f formalized in terms of uh, what project is going to be first that we'll focus on. Um, uh, we're still, you know, open to discussion uh, about that. Uh, one other uh, piece of information is that uh, we did, as I may have mentioned before, uh, we had an architect uh, from the Preservation Trust um, uh, come down and uh, walk through uh, Watroba's and uh, um, we're waiting for a conditions assessment from him. Uh, we're hoping it'll be, you know, soon. He, he told us it was about six weeks and we're approaching that. And uh, um, so that's where we stand. Do you know when the state or this village trust initiative is planning to make the down select from 80 to 20? Uh, they mentioned that uh, in the uh, late July, August uh, time period, uh, we'll find out. Okay, great. Does that mean all 20 will get some funding or is it pared down again? Um, there, uh, if, we, if we're accepted in that first group of 20, uh, even from that 20, they're gonna accept six or seven uh, uh, first uh, applicants, and 
the pot of money is going to be somewhere between a hundred thousand and four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Each or total? Uh, it, it, no, it's going to. That's the range. Uh, the, the range that they will provide to us okay. is uh, on the low end. It'll be a hundred thousand. On the high end, it'll be four fifty. That's a tough program. Well, fun <laughs> fundraising is going to be an important function. Yeah. There is a second round after this first round, so we'll get another bite at that. Yes, yes. You mean if you're not in that first group of six to seven, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, there's going to be another phase in the future. Okay. Good. Okay. Any questions? No. No. Thanks, Jack. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay, solar array. Brian? Yeah. Uh, so we are, the high level would be we are on target to make about as much town-owned power as we could hope for in the next fiscal year, which is kind of when we would want it to start. Uh, because, uh, A, you might have seen that there's been a tremendous amount of clearing around the firehouse. Uh, you know, we... We're imagining that we might take down some of those trees right there near the community garden. And then, uh, first of all, I want to thank Jim Cloud for uh, helping out and uh, Chief Gary Vidham, who I think he hopped in and did a lot of that work. And I was a little worried he wasn't going to stop until he got to Rutland. Uh, <laughs> but it seems like uh, he's really cleared out what he wanted to. So uh, so there's there's plenty of space there. Uh, and I want to thank Kevin Kaya also for uh, hopping on over and doing a bunch of brush clear up and... Uh, of course, Bill for coordinating lots of different things happening there. So, so the site is prepped, uh, and the uh, just this morning, uh, Bill answered the call again to go over and help out with layout, just to kind of confirm that this is where the array will be situated. It's pretty much exactly where we said it was going to be. It shifted maybe 10 feet further east than we'd originally drawn on our map, just based on getting elevations right. It's all within setbacks and everything. It's still on the same side of the trees. Um, and uh, they've mapped out where the wires will go underground, so there needs to be a dig safe assessment, which is going to happen. Uh, but everybody's pretty pleased with kind of where, where it all looks like and where it will be. Uh, and uh, we should expect that on June 24th, the ground screws will go in, uh, and then on the heels of that, they will uh, start building uh, the array itself. And uh, the expectation of the project managers is that by the end of that week, the array footprint with all of the panels on it will be up for people to see. Uh, that won't be turned on until uh, later than that. Uh, and that's why I'm being ambiguous because there's a bit of interconnection that needs to happen. There's a state inspection and then uh, GMP needs to do some work before they'll actually flip the switch. And to the point that I raised earlier, because we also understand where we are in the fiscal year, like we don't want that to turn on before July anyway. So, uh, so so some, and their catamount's well aware, everybody knows invoicing and everything will happen uh, when we hit the next fiscal year, which is what the voters approved uh, and we've been managing towards, and it's even in the contract. So everybody understands that. But that said, we'd like it turned on as soon into the next fiscal year as possible because this is when the sun is shining, uh, it's when we're gonna make most of our hay. So uh, we would love to get it turned on uh, as soon as we can. So uh, that took lots of effort from lots of folks and we appreciate the support of the select board and all the folks in the community who've, who've stepped up in lots of ways to make this happen. Um, yeah, Bill, please, if you want to answer. Just, just uh... Just one uh, technical footnote that I learned today, because I was trying to massage the exact layout just a little bit to minimize the impact on the community garden. And I learned, Brian probably already knew this stuff, but I'm sort of new to the solar game, that changing the orientation from true solar south by, it's, it's got to be right on the azimuth. And if it varies a degree one way or the other, we lose 10% efficiency of the panels. So I basically said, put it where you get maximum efficiency. So I'm saying that because if anybody complains about the exact orientation, it's important to understand it got fine-tuned to get maximum efficiency out of the investment. And changing it is just going to drop down the efficiency, and I didn't think anybody wanted to see that. So, so if anybody has any complaints, 
No, Brian. Brian. I just heard. Yeah, that's what he said. He says he made the decision, the executive decision. All right. Sure. Decided as well. It looks like a really good layout, and uh, even though there's like scattered and scattered scads of acres of good soil there, it's really not an impact on if, if we, if we, uh, you know, have everybody can enjoy it. Great. Yep. I have to say, I, I love the image of uh, solar panels with a community garden in and around it. Uh, <laughs> that, I don't know, just says about the town as you're driving by. And uh, so, I don't know, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, so, and, and I should say in the context of press, uh, the Vermont Standard called uh, today. They want to do another story on the whole thing, so we'll get a little uh, something out there. It's nice. It's yeah. nice. nice. Well, uh, I was just one other comment. I was hoping uh, Chief Vitter might be the first fire chief of Vermont to claim total solar power for the building, but unfortunately, we're number two. Barnard beat us to the punch. Oh. Dang, <laughs> Dang Barnard. <laughs> Brian, to piggyback on something you and I were just talking about, just so we get it out into the public here, yeah. there's been an issue in the paper about the, um, what is it, the amount of payback or credit that you get from Green Mountain Power is being reduced for solar power. We're not affected by that. Would you just speak to that for a second? Yeah, thanks for that. Actually, there are, there are two things that uh, you may see about solar that are relevant to our plan uh, that I absolutely wanted to make sure anything that, that I... We had put before the town as part of our model were going to stay the way they are and again to the point of like fast action and being able to move this through it was well considered and we all worked together on this but the fact that we did it when we did meant that we had our applications in before uh, any changes that came subsequently to the net metering rate which is how much credit you get per kilowatt hour is generated has been dropped uh, I believe by two cents now from where the model was that I presented to all of you before, uh, but we are grandfathered in because we had our uh, application in before that will happen, which is gonna be, I think at the end of July is when it kicks over to the new rate. Uh, and the second thing that uh, is also changing is the group net metering aspect of that. And what that means is uh, the way that our system is gonna work is we're gonna make a whole lot of power behind uh, the firehouse. The firehouse gets all of the power that it needs and then all of the extra we can credit to other buildings in town, two meters. So that's a, that's a group net metering setup. That is going away too. However, again, everybody who has it will be grandfathered in and will continue forward. So we're fine on that. Uh, it's going to change on approach like this starting next year for other municipalities or anybody else who's doing this. So um, there are details under that we don't need to uh, you know, go into, but I would just say uh, that was another change that came through. So again, just grateful for, you know, but on the one hand, all the due diligence that was done, and on the other hand, the ability to sort of move because it meant that uh, we're sitting where we'd want to be in the context of those nice. changes. Yeah. Um, I, I want to say one other thing, too, to build on what uh, Bill was saying, our gratitude to Martha for all of her support through all of this and making us aware of additional grants that will really dovetail with, with the, the investment that we've made behind uh, the firehouse over time the MERP uh, program in particular, what we can do to the efficiency of our buildings and start, for example, thinking about if we can get it for free, storage of energy at the firehouse, as an example, would be a really great thing. If we can make it and then store our energy and have it available. And mm. there's just things that come from that. And the yeah. state wants to incentivize that now too. So we're hopeful, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do our work and we'll get our grants together uh, this fall, but uh, hopefully this sets off a cascade of things that we'll, that we'll be able to build on and I should, in case anyone gets worried about that, that's all state dime. If we get it at all, it will all come from the state. It's, there's no ask of the town for any of those things. So more to come, hopefully. Good. Great. Great. Thank you. Thanks yep. very much. You guys are doing a great job. Nothing else, I assume, on the, no questions on the story? No. Okay. no. All right, getting to the end of the uh, agenda. The last, Second last item we have here is a website policy review and signature. So the town is getting caught up on a number of policies that we just need to make sure we have in place. Um, Callista has done a good job of putting together a website policy for the town here, something that the select board will end up signing and then it'll be published for everybody to see. I don't think it's necessary to read this or uh, we have read it. I don't think it's necessary to read it in public and take up everybody's time, but um, 
once we do get it out there, if there are questions, please let us know if anybody has any questions or issues. I think it's pretty generic and um, hopefully non-controversial. Okay. Any thoughts on, should we, any desire to read it out loud or do you have a, I, something you want to bring up in public, Lisa? No, not at all. I think it's, it's very basic. It just says what will be contained on the website and that sort of thing and, you know, who can advertise on there and it's pretty generic. Okay. All Unless right. you guys would like it read. I'd love to read a two-page policy it's document to you guys excellent. if you want. <laughs> it's not dry at all. <laughs> okay, down into, uh, what do you think, Mr. Allen? You okay with anything else you wanted to say on the, the website policy? No, I'm good. Good, okay. I'm good. Uh, other items. So, yes. What? There's a pump track? Yep, the kids went up there. I walked up there on Friday and it looks great. And the kids found it on Saturday and they made good use of it. <laughs> and I thought I'll see how quickly I could injure myself on it. <laughs> pretty cool looking. It looks really great. But you haven't been on it yet, Annie? I walked it. You walked it, okay. <laughs> Did you jump off the rocks? What's that? Did you jump off the rocks? No. No. <laughs> That's awesome. I had no idea that that was done already. Yeah, they, me either. I was pretty impressed when I walked up there. I thought nice. they were still going to be on work. Okay. I got, so the, I got one thing. Yeah, please, go ahead. Um, I forgot to mention under highways, we applied <clears throat> for a structures grant for the culvert on Brown Schoolhouse Road uh, that caused us all the problems in Irene and in j last July, as I'm sure this lady over here is well aware. Uh, and I got a letter, or actually an email back from Chris Bump, who is the district uh, four, one of the uh, technicians at district four, engineers. And it says, greetings, I am writing to inform you that your application for the Town Highway Structures Program grant for Town Highway 44 Brown Schoolhouse Road has been recommended for approval. Once the grant has been fully, fully executed, a copy will be sent for your files. Doesn't mean we have it, but it does mean that it's passed the first stage. First step. And that is to change that culvert that is <clears throat> about a half a mile, six tenths of a mile up Brown Schoolhouse Road. It's currently uh, 66 by 36 or something like that, what they call a squashed culvert, into a box culvert that is 14 feet wide by eight foot deep. Uh, and uh, the depth will be minimized by two feet because we have to put two feet of gravel in the bottom of it so the fish knows where to go to get up the stream. Uh, can't swim through concrete, concrete, I guess. Yeah. Anyhow, it'll be six by 14, which is significantly bigger than the culvert that's there now. So hopefully. Only 30 years or something we've been working on this, Robert? <laughs> What's that? We've only been working on this 30 years or something? Well, we've been working on it a while, and finally it's, it's come around at least as passed the first approval. And usually, Usually, don't take me to court on this, but usually if it gets by there, we get the money. It's about a $200,000 project. <clears throat> so that's nice. It. I'm done. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lisa, do you have anything on the other side? Yes, um, briefly on the other side. After our lengthy conversation last month with um, Jeremy Reed, um, one of the things that Marie Caduto had mentioned was clearing out some of the wood in the brooks, and I said I would follow up on that with her. I did chat with her. As everyone knows and was told, wood in the brooks is generally a good thing, so in general, they're against taking it out of there. However, they said if, if there are some sites, and I also spoke with Scott Jensen, who is the uh, river engineer, I had a chance to meet him as well, um, that 
within a certain distance from bridges or culverts that perhaps those areas could be cleared and Scott Jensen said that he would take a look at any sites that we targeted and he'd be happy to do that and so the next step is someone, probably me and my husband, <laughs> walking up the, the north branch there to kind of pinpoint those areas and see if there's any snags within that distance that could be looked at. That's it. But he didn't say what that distance is? Um, feet, half mile, nothing like that? It is roughly 100 to 200 feet. Mm. So it's, you know, can't go all the way up or right. be within that. Which is, which is not very far. It's right? not very far. No, right. there's no trees only 100 to 200 feet up. Exactly. Oh, I, I know, exactly. but... Problems further up. Yep. Okay. Thanks for looking into that, Lisa. Sure. Any, anything else? Any other others? Any other others? Um, I guess maybe briefly to jump on the tail of the pump track, uh, John and the rec committee also spoke to um, Dylan Rowley and about perhaps helping or asking him again if he would help with clearing off the site up there for the ball field. The he ball said field. he'd be very happy to help. So that will be the next start. Nice. Great. Bob, any other others? I don't. I have a couple of other others. Um, just for an announcement, people may have seen this already, but the Vermont 100 is going to be coming up here shortly. Uh, it's going to be I believe, Saturday the 20th and Sunday the 21st. So, you know, that tends to wander through our town, just as a heads up. Um, I mentioned last month that we had hoped to have the uh, engineering firm in that's doing the wastewater study come in to brief us this month. Uh, they're not quite ready, so we're pushing that off again. So hopefully next month we'll have Du Bois and King in here to talk about the status of the, the wastewater study. Where they're supposed to be at at this point is at their 60% solution, which is where they have identified potential sites in the town that could hand, potentially handle some kind of wastewater treatment locations or facilities, something like that. So uh, hopefully we'll get a brief on that uh, next month. Any question? Yeah, Kev. Um, are there hard copy uh, reports that they have submitted to the town office? They submitted a, I think, I don't know if it's a hard copy report, they submitted a, a briefing for their 30% solution, the last one, which was months ago, right. have not for this particular one yet. No. Thank you. Okay. Um, once they, as soon as that comes out, which I suspect will probably be just before the next select board meeting, we'll make sure we can get, make that available publicly. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, let's see, lastly, um, I mentioned at the beginning the challenges we have with acoustics in this room. So there are a couple of things that we're looking at, namely hanging, potentially hanging some acoustic paneling on the wall to absorb sound, um, upgrading or changing the audio visual to make it a little bit more, I don't know, permanent's not the right word, but there's a lot of setup and teardown involved before every meeting that goes on in here. We'd like to try to minimize that if we could. So um, Jerry Marletta and Patrick Cody are looking at the technical side of things to see how we do that. And we actually had an acoustical engineer who recommended some panels to us. And so I'm asking what, what will be involved with these panels. They come, they just need to be hung. But they'll probably end up being hung right below that track that we hang pictures on all around. That track kind of needs to be just extended out two inches. Very easy to do, but I'm looking for somebody to be willing to volunteer their time um, to come and help move these hangers out and hang panels. It's probably within the next month or two, something like that, nothing we're gonna do immediately, but I'm just looking for help, okay? And I think that was 
blessed I had for other. Any other others out in the audience? Yes. I, I told you I was done, but I'm not quite done. You're not done? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just, I was watching tonight as we moved the microphone around with a stand and the cord is long enough. I think going forward, just get rid of the stand and someone take the microphone and hand it off and hang on to it until someone else wants it would be a lot simpler, uh, which would or help a lot. Mic. Or get a wireless mic, either yep. way. Yep. But I, I think that would help the confusion a little bit. Okay, thank you. Yep, I agree with you. Try it on now. Sure. <laughs> Push on it. All right. <laughs> oh gosh, she's got a mic. I just wanted to. <laughs> I just wanted to say the future of writing in the Rec Commission hosted a pancake breakfast oh, this past yes. Saturday. We saw a lot of people there. We had, I think, over a hundred people show up. So. Thank you to everybody who worked on this. Thank you for t to Callista and Esther who put the little sandwich board outside. Um, and Callista came in early to let us in. So we just really appreciate everybody who helped make that happen, several of whom are here tonight. Um, not a ton of announcements. We are, have set a date for October 5th for the fall festival. So that is happening. Um, Lisa Kaya and I are organizing that, and we have a whole team of volunteers willing to help. Um, so far, we have a couple of food trucks signed up, and we have three bands lined up to play music, and we have a handful of other food vendors um, lined up. So we're in good shape on that. And then the last thing is we're in the planning stages for our July meeting for the Future is Reading. And we haven't set an agenda yet, but we aim to have that advertised in the informer. We know the deadline is Friday or Saturday. Um, and we hope that we'll see many new faces there. So that's it. Thanks, sure. Future of Reading Group is shown here, pulling stuff like that together. So well done, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Bob, anything else? Nope. Lisa? No, I think we're good. OK. We have uh, an executive session that we, oh, it's Stacy. And somebody on the online. Hey, Stace, yeah. Stacy Gallagher, Planning Commission. I just wanted to thank Martha and Patrick, or um, Jason, for their support uh, to the PC and the ZBA um, in our recent months. Um, very much appreciate that, that sounding board. Thanks, Stacy. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Definitely echo that comment. Anything else from anybody online? No? Okay. All right, we have an executive session we have to go into to talk about some um, employee compensation issues. But other than that, thank you everybody for showing up, and we'll see you next month. Thank you.